Are viruses alive? Well, let's ask the experts. Here we are at the Australian National University. We have experts here, biologists. We keep them in this building, the Research School of Biology, also known as the Robertson Building. Ah, there's one now. Are you a biologist? Yes, I am. Are viruses alive? I'm not competent to answer this question, but uh, if I have to answer, I will say probably yes. Are you a biologist? I'm studying biology, yeah. Uh -huh. And are viruses alive? It's a really hard question. It's something that's currently debated a lot in the scientific community. My personal view is yes, um, but that personal view honestly changes month to month. You hear new research come out that makes it seem maybe less or more alive, and it's really, really hard. I kind of think that it's similar to when you ask little kids, is a fire alive? Because mm. it's got everything that you teach little kids is alive, but we know a fire isn't living. So. Do you think this question makes sense? Yes, but it's kind of one which doesn't really have an answer yet. Mm. So you think we will find out sometime soon? I hope so. <laughs> Gotta hope. We're looking for a biologist. We need a biologist. Excuse me, sir. Are you a biologist? Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> so are you a biologist? Yes. And are viruses alive? No. <laughs> Why do you say that? Well, it's a, I mean, you're looking at a bit of a fine gradient, but there's a sort of an agreed criteria for what's alive. And, and one of those things is, one of those criteria is that you're able to reproduce independently of any other cell. And so viruses can't reproduce in independently of their host cell. Uh, and that's sort of a key criteria for me. Hi, are you a biologist? I am. And are viruses alive? They have some attributes of life and they lack some attributes of life. What do you think they lack? Uh, they're unable to replicate independently of, without parasitizing something else. Can you reproduce un independently without parasitizing something else? Like the oxygen made by the plants behind us? Good question. Uh, which, is <laughs> which is why when I came to define life in a first year biology class, I couldn't do it. I had to admit that I must have missed that bit in the textbook. <laughs> wait, so wait a minute, here we have a whole room full of people who are studying life and they don't know what they're studying? Absolutely. So let's talk about bacteria. There's a bacteria, there's a bacteria. What's inside them? Let's have a closer look. Well. If this is the bacterial cell, it has bacterial DNA is in red here, but inside those cells also things called plasmas, plasmids. They're circular, smaller pieces of uh, DNA. And uh, there are up to thousands of these plasmids in a bacterial cell. And the DNA, of course, is made of the nucleotides. And there's a base pair. Now, this is a plot here. Now, it's a logarithmic plot, 1, 10, 100 nucleotide base pairs in kilobase pairs. How many kilobase? That's a thousand base pairs. So here's a thousand, here's ten thousand, here's a hundred thousand, here's a million base pairs. So these plasmids <coughs> are smaller than the host bacteria. They go from 200 to about one. So one to about 200 is the size of these plasmids. But over here, the host DNA, the bacterial DNA, goes from 14 mega base pairs to about 130. So there's a little bit of an overlap here, but you can see that the red has more base pairs than the blue. What about viruses? Well, interestingly, viral genomes span this range right here. So pretty much the same as plasmids. So in some sense, plasmids are viruses that are just living inside of cells all the time. Most of which, mo the function of these things, uh, we're not quite sure of. Some we do know, but most we don't. So here's E. coli. Now some cruel chemist uh, dissolved the uh, membranes of an E. coli and it spurted its guts all over the place. And this is the DNA. Actually, these are the plasmids that were inside the E. coli. And this is the host genome. And you can see the host genome is much bigger. It's about 100 times bigger than the plasmids. Uh, so inside of these bacteria, we know we have DNA, host DNA, and we have plasmids. Now those are yellow things there. Those yellow arrows are pointing to viruses. And they're trying, they're, this is a pillus between the bacteria. The bacteria are trying to exchange plasmids, 
but the viruses are trying to get their DNA inside the pilus so that those, that piece of DNA can be taken up and then replicated by the host machinery of the, of the bacterial cell. <clears throat> now viruses, as you can see, are about 100 times smaller than the bacteria, and there are at least uh, 10 times more numerous. So you can see there's many, many, many more viruses than there are bacterial cells in this image. And viral genomes are about the same size as plasma genomes, as we saw earlier. So there are some viruses. There's some three bacterial cells. Viruses trying to get inside those pili. And uh, if we look very closely, we can see the viruses again. And that line, diagonal line, is, is a pilus. And uh, those viruses are trying to get inside. Those are capsids for around the outside of the viruses. And the viruses have capsids, but plasmids that live inside the cells do not. Now, here's a blow up of viruses attacking a cell. So there's the cell on the lower right, and there's the double-stranded DNA inside the capsids of the uh, viruses. And uh, just to, as a background check, we have a spitting double-stranded DNA on the right-hand side, but let's compare single-stranded Let's compare single-stranded DNA, I'm sorry, single-stranded RNA to double-stranded DNA. So the R stands for ribose. The D stands for deoxyribose, so that's a different type of sugar that's in this backbone. Now, these three nuclei, these cytosine, guanine, and adenine are the same in RNA and DNA, but there's one big difference. It's thymine over here and uracil over here, and I say it's a big difference, but really look at this molecule of thymine, look at this molecule of uracil, and you can see that they're pretty much the same except for this group here. So let's have talk, look, look, let's look at the main types of bacterial viruses. So there is single-stranded RNA and double-stranded RNA, and right here, this blue is an envelope that uh, some viruses have envelopes. Some have cap only capsids, some have capsids and envelopes. Then we have single-stranded DNA viruses. That also exists. And we have double-stranded DNA viruses. They say, tend to be a little bit bigger. Now, I've done a survey of biologists. And I've gone around asking, are viruses alive? And here is the result of that survey, the approximate crude results. So about a quarter of biologists say, no, viruses are not alive. They're very convinced. About a quarter say, yes, they are alive. Another quarter say, I don't know. <laughs> and another quarter, the remaining quarter say, it's not an important question. So that pretty much summarizes the uh, survey of biologists. And as you can see, there is no consensus. And so we should not think that there is a consensus about what viruses are and whether we know what the boundaries of life are. So I think that the existence of viruses is good evidence that there's no well-defined boundary between life and non-life. Now, this is interesting as a general principle, and Richard Dawkins, who thinks we're all Africans, th calls, this, uh, calls this conceptual problem the tyranny of the discontinuous mind. When you ask, is it A or B? Are viruses alive or dead? That's a discontinuous mind question, and it leads nowhere. It's like thinking black and white. So the division between life and non-life is another case of the tyranny of the discontinuous mind. This is a quote from his book, The Ancestor's Tale, and it continues, it is an irrelevant semantic point whether we choose to label viruses as alive. So Richard Dawkins believes he's one of the quarter that says, oh, it's not a question, it's not an important question. Now suppose we discover a planet, however, let's just consider, suppose we discover a planet, there it is, and on which there are viruses. There they are, all those are viruses, but no cellular life. Have we discovered life elsewhere? So if we can't say whether viruses are alive or not, then we can't say whether we've discovered life elsewhere. We've discovered something interesting and beautiful about the universe, but we cannot ask the black and white question or cannot answer the black and white question. Now, in the same book, Richard writes, Rather than arranging its own replication, a virus hijacks host cells to do so. Why is it there inside the cell? Clearly because it can arrange for its own reproduction. And I read this and I said, Richard, this doesn't make sense. You say rather than arrange its own replication, and then you say because it can arrange its own reproduction. 
So I'm, I'm confused. Surely he's not making a big difference between replication and reproduction. So do they or do they not arrange their own replication? I would say, don't we or don't all life forms hijack resources to arrange for our own reproduction? I don't like this uh, dissing of viruses because they are dependent on other life forms because all life forms are dependent on other life forms. Now, some people say viruses are not alive because they can't reproduce by themselves. They are not reproductively or metabolically autonomous. So that is the, the slur that the quarter of biologists who think the viruses are not alive, that's how they express themselves when they're being articulate. But let's consider mitochondria. These are two mitochondria, and they reproduce inside human cells. From their point of view, our cells are comfortable places to live and reproduce. But from our point of view, they are organelles that are part of us. If we only knew of the diseases that mitochondria cause, rather than what they can do for us, then some people would think them unworthy of being called alive. These are the same people who think that viruses are not alive. Here is an ant milking an aphid, drinking that, that ball of liquid has sugar in it, and the ant is using it. It's kind of like milk, kind of like a little cow. And here's a human being milking a cow. And here are the aphids sucking out the juice from a young stem. So they, in some sense, they too are they're parasitic off the juice inside the stem. And here's an anteater that just loves eating the ants that have eaten, that have, <laughs> that have drunk the wonderful sugary fluid from the aphids that have that got it from the inside of its plant stem. Anyway, all life forms live in a network of obligate mutual dependence. No life form is reproductively or metabolically autonomous. So if you have a life form that depends on another life form, that depends on another life form, that depends, you know, who is the parasite here? Who is it that we're supposed to exclude from being alive? Where's the autonomy here? There is no autonomy. And the idea of, oh, you're not autonomous as a slur doesn't make sense to me at all. As a matter of fact, here's uh, Barbara McClintock and she lived from 1902 to 1992, and she got the Nobel Prize in 1983 for her discovery of jumping genes and transposons in corn or maize that have gigantic chromosomes, and that's why she could look at them. She says there was written up, she, her life uh, was written up a feeling for the organism, <laughs> organism by uh, Keller here. It's a very nice book, and here she is holding her corn, and she said every component of the organism is as much of an organism as every other part. And I think we should take that seriously. These biologists are parasites because they cannot reproduce without living inside their host. And their host is this envelope of oxygen, atmospheric oxygen that we're all breathing, produced by our benefactors, the plants here. Now, despite this dependence, I think, Biologists are alive. <sighs>